Hi everyone, this is Edward Lam from Monash University. This talk is about exact approaches to the multi-agent collective construction problem. Let's consider a planning problem in robotics. On the right side, there is a picture that shows a 3D structure. This structure is made up of several grey blocks. In this problem, we have a set of robots and the task is to get the robot to build this structure in a swarm-like manner. So the robots begin off the blocks world and then they enter the blocks world carrying blocks and they need to rearrange the blocks to build this structure. Sometimes they will need to construct ramps to use as stairs to access the higher levels of the structure and then after they are done, the robots need to deconstruct the ramps and remove the ramps off the blocks world, leaving the structure intact at the end of the planning horizon. Presently, all of the existing approaches are based on heuristics and the state of the art is based on a multi-agent reinforcement learning approach. So we try to study this problem using exact methods. We constructed an integer programming model and a constraint programming model to solve this problem. Our integer programming model is based on a network flow and our CP model is also based on a different type of network flow, although we did try sequencing CP models in the past. Our IP model takes up to 7 days to solve optimally some of these very simple instances that appeared in the state-of-the-art reinforcement learning paper. We tried it on 6 instances and the IP model took up to 7 days to solve. The CP model wasn't able to solve these instances optimally even though they were actually very tiny. So in our conclusions we found that the IP model was better than the CP model because the IP technology was able to exploit these network flow structures much more effectively and the CP model probably didn't perform as well because it had a lot of weak propagation coming from disjunction and implication constraints. Now let's take a look at the details. This here is the Termes robots. Here we have a video showing a yellow robot and a blue robot constructing a 3D structure. The yellow robot picks up a block and then it walks across to the right where it places down the block at the corner. Next you see the blue robot walking across on top of the block that was just placed by the yellow robot and then using that to access the higher level where it just placed the block right now. Next you see the yellow robot going across to the right and then placing another block. That happens here. And then the blue robot walks on top to place the, its block at the corner again. So this video shows the collective nature of these robots. In an instance with many many more robots, they will behave in a swarm-like manner and this type of swarm behavior is what we are trying to model in our problem. So our MAC problem is based on these Termes robots developed at Harvard. Let's take a look at the problem in more detail. The MAC is a discrete optimization problem studied in classical planning. So it hasn't been studied in terms of discrete optimization technologies such as CP and IP before. The MAC is a problem that models the Termes robots that we saw in the video on the previous slide. In the MAC problem, there is a set of cooperative agents which must build a 3D structure within a blocks world, such as the one shown on the right. In this blocks world, there is grey blocks and robots use this, these grey blocks to build the 3D structure. We can have almost any kind of structure, but we cannot have those that look like caves because caves are hollow underneath and the pillars need blocks underneath to support them. The single agent version of this problem appeared in the 2018 International Planning Competition. So let's take a look at an example in more detail. At the beginning of the planning horizon, in time step 0, the blocks world is initially empty. There is nothing in this blocks world. In time step 1, we have two robots coming in. We have a black robot coming in from the right and a yellow robot coming in from the far end. Both robots are carrying one block on top of them. In time step 2, the yellow robot proceeds into the middle while still continuing to carry the block. The black robot 
puts down its block, which is shown in blue to highlight that it's just been put down in the current time step. In time step 3, the black robot moves out of the, blo the block's world. The yellow robot proceeds to move towards the center again. In time step 4, the black robot appears on the other side of the block's world. In this problem, we assume that the robots can move with infinite speed outside of the block's world, such as what just happened with the black robot. Also in time step 4, the yellow robot puts down the block that it was just carrying, which we show in blue to highlight this. In time step 5, the yellow robot moves across one block and it picks up the block that was put down by the black robot in the previous time steps. This bl block that's picked up by the yellow robot is highlighted in red. The black robot puts down the blue block that it just brought in from outside. In time step 6, the black robot moves off the blocks world again and now the yellow robot has successfully picked up the red block in the previous time step. In time step 7, the yellow robot puts down that block that it just picked up which we highlight in blue and the black robot comes in with another block. In the next time step, the yellow robot will pick up the red block. So now in time step 8, the yellow robot has completed picking up the red block in the previous time step and the black robot puts down the blue block behind the yellow robot. Next we have the yellow robot climbing up on top of the block that I just put down and the black robot moves away again. And now the yellow robot puts the block onto the upper floor of the structure and the black robot returns with another block. In time step 11, the yellow robot proceeds to move off of the block's world. The black robot brings in the final block and it puts it there in time step 12 shown in blue. In time step 13, the yellow robot proceeds to move off again and the black robot picks up the ramp that it just used to access the upper floor of the structure. In time step 14, that ramp is picked up and the robot leaves in time step 15, leaving the structure completed. So this is the entire planning horizon of one of these very, very tiny instances. So now let's define the problem more formally. A cell is a 3D coordinate consisting of an X, Y and Z coordinate. A position is a 2D coordinate consisting of an X and Y coordinate only. So you can think of a position as a top-down view from the top of the blocks world. Here we show the rules of the game. Robots and blocks are the size of one cell. Robots initially begin outside of the blocks world and then they come in into the blocks world from the outside. Robots can move to a neighboring cell, wait at the same cell, pick up a block or put down a block from a neighboring position. These are the four actions that can occur at any given time step. Robots can climb up or down one level that is up or down one block in a neighboring position. At the end of the planning horizon, all robots must exit the world and the structure must be completed. There is an infinite supply of blocks available outside of the blocks world. And outside this blocks world, robots can act infinitely fast. That means they can pick up blocks and they can put down the blocks that it was carrying outside and the robots can also appear in the next time step on a different side of the blocks world that we saw in the example in the previous few slides. In this problem, we use a lexicographic objective. We first minimize the number of time steps, which is called megspan, and then after that, we minimize the number of actions, which we call sum of costs. So let's take a look at the integer programming model. This IP model is based on network flow and we know that IP exploits network flow structure very well. 
We have one network flow for each position. These network flows represent the pillars growing up or down in height at each position. And this network flow is actually a shortest path problem. We also have one network flow for all of the robots together. That is one network flow for all the robots, not one network flow for each robot. And by doing this, we don't have any robot symmetries. Because in otherwise, each robot, if it was assigned a particular index or a number, then you have symmetries. So using one network flow for all robots avoids these symmetries. In our network, we have a coordinate in terms of the current time step, the current cell, the carrying state, and the action, and the next cell where the robot will be. The carrying state is a 0-1 state indicating whether the robot is currently carrying a block or not. And then we also have interdependency constraints between the network flows of the positions and the network flow of all the robots. And in doing this, we have a very clean IP model. All of the complexities is hidden inside the state, which is the current time, the current cell, and all of that. So the, the model is very clean overall. So this slide sl shows the complete model. We have the yellow constraints, and these specify the height at the first and the last time steps. These are the initial conditions and the boundary conditions. We also have the blue constraints, and these govern the flow of the height through space and time. Then we have the green constraints, and these are the flows of the robots through space and time. The next yellow constraints prevent edge collisions and vertex collisions. This means that robots cannot be at the same position at the same time, and they cannot cross each other. The blue constraint limits the number of robots on the blocks world at any given time. And the final green constraints are the robot and height interdependency constraints. They say that if a robot puts down a block, then the height must grow up by one level, and if the robot removes a block, then the height must drop by one level. And the final yellow constraints are the variable domains. So you can see that this structure of the IP model is very simple. We have two network flow structure, and then they are connected by some kind of interdependencies. Now let's take a look at the constraint programming model in more detail. We initially started with a sequencing model using the regular global constraint because we know that CP propagates regular very well. In this model, we had one regular constraint for each robot. And this wasn't very effective in practice because there is robot symmetries, meaning that every robot is assigned a particular index and there are many, many equivalent solutions arising from permuting the index of the robots. These robot symmetries made the model very slow to solve. So we changed to a network flow model similar to the integer programming model. But then by doing this, the model was much faster because there is no robot symmetries even though CP likes the regular global constraint more than network flow structure. In this new CP model, the network flow is much simpler than the IP network flow. In this network flow, we only have positions. We don't have the complex height and the carrying state. Instead, we have integer variables representing the height at each position. The value of these integer variables contains the height rather than encoding the height into the network flow. And then we have robot and position interdependencies, which we model using implication constraints. And we know that implication constraints propagate very weakly. And finally, we have element global constraints, which we use to model collisions. So let's take a look at the CP model in more detail. You can see here that the CP model is much, much more complex. The yellow constraints at the top state the height, initial conditions, and the boundary conditions. And then we have one of these blue constraints, which state the flow of the height through space and time. Next, we have the green constraints, which are the robot, initial conditions, and boundary conditions. And then we have the yellow constraints, which model the logic of the robot actions. This is the picking up and the moving and so on. 
Next, we have the blue constraints, and these prevent vertex collisions and edge collisions, the same things as the IP model. The green constraints limit the number of robots. And finally, we have the yellow constraints, which model the logic of the pillars. This is about growing and decreasing height of each pillar. And the blue constraints at the end are just the variable domains. We used these six instances from the state-of-the-art reinforcement learning paper. These six instances, as you can see, are very tiny and they are very, very simple. Despite this, the problem is very difficult to solve. Let's take a look at our results. This table shows the experiments. The top half shows the IP model and the bottom half shows the CP model. For the IP model, the first instance is solved in 29 seconds and the second instance is solved in 3 seconds. The fifth instance is solved in 5.7 days, so even though the IP model has nice simple structure, it still takes a very long time to solve these very simple and tiny instances. The CP model performs much worse. The second instance is solved in 1.2 hours and the remaining 5 instances it does not solve optimally within 7 days. So overall, the IP model solves more instances than the CP model and it scales much better. So in our conclusions, we found that the IP model performs better than the CP model because of its network flow structure. We know that IP solvers exploit network flow structure very well in practice. The difficulty in the IP model comes from, from its interdependencies between the robots and the pillars. Each pillar needs a robot to put down a block so that it can grow up in height one level. But for the robot to access this pillar, it needs neighbouring pillars of a similar height. So there is a complex interdependency between the pillars and the robots. The CP model has weaker propagation because it has many implication constraints to use to model the logic of the pillars and the robots. So overall, the MAC problem can be solved exactly for tiny instances, but they still require very long run times. Our exact approaches can solve their six instances using a few tens of time steps, whereas the reinforcement learning approach uses hundreds of time steps. Our exact approaches also can solve for many, many more robots, up to tens of robots, compared to the reinforcement learning approach. So for future directions, we want to develop rotational symmetry breaking constraints. You saw in the six instances that the structures are effectively rotating around some center axis. So using rotational symmetry breaking constraints, perhaps we can only build the structure on one of the four corners of the instance and then replicate this across the other three corners. And then after doing this, we can use either the IP or the CP model within a large neighborhood search or some kind of local search that exploits the problem structure to solve it much faster. Thanks for listening.